Rapid Start is uh, an implementation strategy where you initiate antiretroviral therapy or HIV medication as soon as possible after a person is diagnosed. Um, ideally, uh, same day if possible. Uh, so really having someone who is newly diagnosed be linked into care and started on medication um, that is quite easy to tolerate, incredibly effective and life-saving um, as soon as possible within uh, you, we, uh, potentially same day, some say within 72 hours. We could talk more about that in terms of how we want to frame the conversation about rapid start in terms of timing. Um, so I'm going to talk about implementation, equity, advocacy, and policy. I do not have any financial disclosures. I will not be talking about any medication off-label. Um, if uh, any of you uh, don't know, this is AIDS View. It's actually a great website. If you, it's out of Emory. Um, you could really drill in in terms of the incidence of HIV or the prevalence. This map is of incidence. This was back in 2016 when we uh, first started planning a rapid start intervention. I was in New Orleans, as you heard from Dr. Allison. New Orleans had the highest rate, uh, or second, I guess, to uh, Miami at that time, second highest rate of new infections. But you can see here being uh, Texas that your uh, interventions such as these can have such effect in communities where there is um, a high uh, uh, risk of transmission of HIV. So if you really drill down, you could see New Orleans was actually off the charts. I mean, we were the highest, as I said, only second to Miami. Uh, in 2016, we had 67 out of every 100,000 people living with HIV uh, or newly diagnosed with HIV in the, in the city of New Orleans. So that, that's an incredibly high rate. And the CDC really recognized that there needed to be interventions um, that brought down that rate of HIV. And I'm going to uh, stop here. Um, because I just want to make sure we're we're all on the same page that once someone is on medication and shortly thereafter, potentially as soon as three weeks after, uh, a person becomes virally suppressed. And at that time, it is impossible to transmit the virus sexually. Um, we're also even getting more data on uh, the incredibly low transition, potentially zero of sharing needles. Um, even though, of course, there's many, many strategies we need to implement. But once someone is virally suppressed, and it's so important to discuss, it's empowering, we're going to get to this a little more, um, but you cannot transmit the virus. So starting people as soon as possible on medications will lower the incidence, keeping people on medications, reengaging people so that they get back on ART. And then for those that are at risk, um, there's a medication, hopefully you know, it's called PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis. Um, and that prevents HIV. So when we're thinking about kind of the cornerstones of how to end the HIV epidemic, um, it is putting people on medication, virally suppressing them, and then recognizing where there's uh, those at risk uh, that we should have uh, easy access to PrEP. So the reason I mention all that is this, uh, you know, I get credit as the medical director that that did this work in New Orleans. This came from the HIV Planning Council, which is a group that meets in New Orleans. It's uh, represented over 50% of people living with HIV. Um, and it was in that meeting that someone stood up and said, uh, if it is so important to get on medication, why are you having any delays in initiating care? If someone is ready today, we should be rolling out that red carpet. And I said, I could not agree more. Um, it took almost a year to think through all of the, the planning. We could go into that a little more. But it was recognizing that as a health system, we should make it as easy as possible to start someone on ART as soon as possible. And, and the person speaking at the planning council wasn't just talking about new diagnoses. They were also talking about people out of care. So it's we started... <laughs> with new diagnoses. And then you'll see at the end of this presentation, we really expanded this to people uh, that were out of care uh, and returning, re-engaging into care as well. So as I was mentioning, a person living with HIV who has an undetectable viral load 
does not transmit the virus to their partners. This is called U equals U. Undetectable is untransmittable. Um, we have uh, overwhelming data to support this. This is endorsed by the CDC as well as the National Institute of Health. Um, there is a great JAMA editorial if you want to uh, dive into this by Isinger and uh, the great uh, Dr. Fauci uh, that uh, really goes into um, the data. But more importantly, how uh, this message um, really ends stigma. It ends stigma um, amongst um, people living with HIV in terms of engaging with family, friends, sex partners, the health system, um, to know once undetectable, there's no risk of transmission. But I think even more importantly, it ends the internalized stigma that so many patients living with HIV have. I'll give one example. One of my favorite patients in New Orleans after he was diagnosed um, in, he was diagnosed in 1999, um, and he did not have another, uh, he had no sexual uh, encounters after he was diagnosed. Um, out of that, even uh, as he felt small concern using a condom of potential transmission, it wasn't until the U equals U message uh, came out and he went to, um, there was a, a great conference in New Orleans that was a conference dedicated of providing the most up-to-date science to people living with HIV. Um, and he walked out of that conference and said, you know, I'm ready to date now, now that I understand this. I mean, so this message is so important. It also means that if we know that someone once they're virally suppressed, they cannot transmit the virus, uh, then we should make it as easy as possible and they should be started on therapy as quickly as possible so they can attain that. And, and we'll get there. Some people always ask even, you know, what is, what's the real difference if you start someone a month sooner or later and we can get to some of the data, but really the most important is for a patient that's a month sooner that that weight is off of their shoulders of the concern of uh, risk of transmission. Here you could see the new HIV diagnoses in San Francisco. They were really the, the city that really leaned in on uh, universal access to ART and PrEP. And you could see as you place patients on PrEP and universal ART, the incidence of uh, HIV diagnoses uh, decreases so quickly. So, you know, this work I, I, I recognize is on the... Um, we are standing on the shoulders uh, of some greatness. And the San Francisco General Hospital was the first to start a rapid model. Um, they took what was typically four visits before starting ART into one visit. And the recognition here is that that one visit included um, insurance, some counseling, starting ART often before labs were obtained. We could do that because of how safe our medications are. Um, and then they would have a follow-up visit uh, shortly thereafter where much of, of what was done pre-starting ART was then uh, done shortly thereafter. Um, and they showed that this was highly effective uh, at their San Francisco uh, General Hospital. I'm going to show you the data in a minute. But what this demonstrated is uh, we can do this and we have a model to do this. And when we were talking about uh, implementing the best science in New Orleans when we had such a high rate of infections. Um, this was one of the examples that we really poured over uh, with our um, HIV planning council. So here's their data. Um, so I wanna just take a moment. Uh, I am now in California, but when I was in New Orleans, we would mock uh, about those in California and especially San Francisco, like the Shangri-La and they could do anything. And it's such a different patient population than we see in New Orleans. Um, there is no question that there's a lot of support, especially in a city um, that has uh, a lot of uh, structural support systems um, in as San Francisco does. But if you look at uh, San Francisco General, that is a clinic that specifically sees those who are uninsured. Um, so you could see here, 28% were homeless, 100% um, were uninsured, and 46% were using illicit substances. And this was already where uh, marijuana was legalized, so that was not considered uh, in the illicit substance use. So this was a, a, a difficult patient population. 39 were started rapidly, and then 47 we're considered that universal. 
And you could see days after ART offer, you have um, within, I mean, one, 24 hours, 95% in the rapid cohort uh, starting ART compared to 97% uh, at day seven. They were even doing better, I would say, at Universal uh, than we were in New Orleans. Um, our uh, model in New Orleans was 21 days um, before after diagnosis that a patient typically had a visit with a provider. So it could be as, as long as 28 days, 21 to 28 days. So really no one was being started on ART before 21 to 28 days. So you could see here, 26%, but I, and, and 100% starting um, by day 30, but you could see most were started um, by day seven. Okay, this, you know, they got um, a lot of recognition. Uh, they were presenting at Croy. They were presenting at, at the AIDS conference. This is the data that I brought back to, um, to my clinicians to convince them. But it wasn't until one of the uh, brilliant uh, people in, in the planning council said, you know, I don't care about the blue bar. I care about the red bar. Look at it, day 30. It's 63% start on ART. What happened to those 27%? And this is, to me, the biggest reason to start a rapid program. It's these people that we're losing, um, and, and we're going to get there in, in the data that I was seeing in New Orleans. Um, but what I have found is when you start someone on ART immediately, it is such a great way to engage. When you delay that treatment, you have such an opportunity for loss, a really concerning opportunity for loss. So, you know, this was to me the big concern. So where were we? I call it the ancient times, pre-rapid. I mean, we now have a, a an absolute commitment at Crescent Care and, and really throughout the city of New Orleans of starting ART immediately. So before rapid, 18% of patients diagnosed in our outreach programs were not linked within 30 days of diagnosis. This was incredibly concerning to me because these are patients that are coming up to us. When we do our outreach programs, we might be at a bar, at a club, but we're doing the testing. We're not, there's no mandate of the testing. This isn't kind of the universal screening in an ER. This is at a club, at a bar, and they're coming to us wanting to know if they're living with HIV. And 18% were not linked within 30 days. And I should say, that's not just at our clinic. I looked at the state of Louisiana. Now they could have been linked outside of Louisiana but 18% were not linked at all in, in Louisiana. So this wasn't just looking, oh, did they link with us? That's a real loss of opportunity. And only 5% of those not linked, so 5% of this 18 were then linked later in the year. So uh, again, this, this unbelievable loss of opportunity, this kind of goes the exact opposite of how you decrease incidents, the fact that we weren't making it easy to link patients immediately um, is actually a driver of incidents. So I, I think there are moments where we have to recognize how does the health system um, harm public health? And when we think of the obstacles, we have to be really honest with ourselves of how those obstacles, what are the downstream effects? And to me, the downstream effects were these folks are not being linked to care. And there are then, because this is a um, public health crisis, there are those many patients um, or people that are now going to contract HIV because we're not starting people as quickly as possible um, and not making it easy as possible to link into care. So again, U equals U, um, bridging the best of biomedical and behavioral sciences. It removes the sense of fear and guilt that one may have of harming someone else. It reduces the self-imposed and external stigma many people with HIV experience. Um, and then it carries these legal implications, right? If someone uh, cannot transmit the virus, we should really end any criminalization uh, of HIV. Um, of course, there are numerous factors into accessing uh, ART. This is really important to recognize uh, in, in the United States. Um, we have uh, programs that support access to ART, but I have to say, and I'll take a moment here, if there's one that's probably more important than anything else, and I know you don't have this in Texas, it is expanded Medicaid. There is no question that the expansion of Medicaid was probably the best um, policy implementation uh, to, to benefit the lives of people living with HIV in Louisiana. Um, and, and that goes, there's, there's overwhelming data for this. Um, when I think about 
what we should be advocating most, it is uh, countrywide implementation uh, of uh, expanded Medicaid. Okay, so let's go into to the nitty gritty of this program. So we called it the Crescent Care Start Initiative. It's patient new, patients newly diagnosed with HIV are seen by a provider within 72 hours, optimally same day, and provided 30 days of ART. Now, I'm, uh, let me stop here that mo almost all these patients, I had no labs. They, we, we go out into the community, we test people, we test them with rapid uh, screening, and then we link them into care. So, you know, I'll ask questions about their kidney function and, and liver function if they know. Um, and we could go into this a little more, but the safety of the medication we have now, we could start immediately. So I said within 72 hours, optimally same day. And the reason I did 72 hours, just in case someone was screened late on a Friday, making sure that they uh, were given that appointment on Monday. Okay, our second cohort was EIS, Early Intervention Services. And that is the same protocol the patients have no idea they are different. I just kept them, uh, I analyzed them a little differently because they were diagnosed over 72 hours and the range was four days to 25, hour, 25 years. So let me give you uh, how this happened. So on week three of starting our intervention of CCSI intervention, uh, a woman came in and said, yeah, I was newly diagnosed yesterday. I came to you all for screening. I had concerns. Um, and I said, why do you have concerns? And she said, you know, the guy that I'm, that I'm with, he's actually sitting in the, in the waiting area. Um, he was diagnosed with HIV four years ago, going to the ER, but he really didn't believe it. And they didn't explain it well. And he just felt like, you know, I, I, I just don't think it's real. Um, so I said, okay, let, let's bring him into the clinic too with you. So, you know, he came in, we retested him. We had a long conversation, the three of us. And I started him on medications that day as well. I mean, for him, there's no reason, there's no difference, right, between between him and his partner, with the exception of he was previously diagnosed, but he was not ready to start ART at that time. And I said, well, this is still an intervention we we need to to do. We need to lean into to a population newly diagnosed, or excuse me, not newly known, but ART naive. So that became EIS. What eventually we did, which is really the the goal of the planning council, uh, was three years later, we started rapid re-entry. So same exact protocol, start ART on same day, but they had to be uh, out of care for greater than nine months and off ART. This population is a little more um, medically complicated because you have to know what previous ART they were on um, so that you can consider if there's any resistance. We know for those who are ART naive, we really can start, we, we, we know for sure and that you can start medications before a genotype is performed. Genotype tells you the resistance um, of, of the HIV virus. And that's because our medication is so effective now, so well tolerated. So let me just say a bias to all of this work is Crescent Cares is FQHC. We do specialty care. We have all this free HIV and STI testing. We have a sexual wellness center. Um, we do gender affirming care. We do addiction medicine, of course, PrEP and PEP. So it really made sense that if a patient came to our clinic and they were newly diagnosed, that we wouldn't say, oh, let me give you an appointment with Dr. Halpern in three weeks. Oh, let me just call and put him on your urgent schedule. You're going to see him today. Um, so it, you know, when I hear about, uh, when I have these conversations, especially in health systems that are a lot more complicated, I recognize this is a bias. This is a bias that, you know, our, these sexual wellness centers um, that are uh, being developed throughout the country, you know, we are trying to make it as easy as possible. Um, and I'm very lucky to be working in, in one of these centers. So let me go over the data. So this was data that I pulled. I've presented this data, but um, I want to make sure you, you see how we did the research to then um, influence our, our advocacy and policy. So the project started December 1st, 2016. Our first CCSI patient was December 6th, 2016. And as I said, it took about six months um, for us really to get this project off the ground. And the reason why is it, doing a rapid start program really helps you to analyze the entire workflow that you have in a clinic. Because what you're really doing is you're saying to yourself, how can I register a patient? How can I make sure that we 
ensure that they, if they don't have insurance, we're enrolling them insurance and we could um, confirm their insurance. Do I have a phlebotomist that's committed to this? Um, is nursing um, okay with patients being added on quickly uh, for a diagnosis? Um, do the providers understand that this is not only medically sound, but this is a best practice? And what is the data to go over for best practice? So all of those things need to be done um, before starting a rapid start. And rapid start, we could discuss at the end. Now there's rapid start prep and rapid start MAT programs, rapid start HCV treatment. So it, it all, you really need to think through um, to make sure those workflows are strengthened. And I'll give you the best example I have. Uh, we had a Thursday when our um, Pam, who's our medical director, uh, our administrative medical director came over and said, Hey, Jason, you know, this afternoon at, at 530, we're cleaning all the floors. So we've got to make sure we're out of out of the clinic by then. And I, I said, uh, uh, you know, OK. Um, and then, of course, you know, this is going to happen at 520. We got a phone call. A patient downstairs just tested uh, reactive for HIV. It was now confirmed by a second test. Can we bring him up for rapid start? And Pam's like, we really can't. And I said, well, um, who's overseeing this? And Alejandro was the head of uh, maintenance. I said, Alejandro, is there any way we could still see this patient? He's like, no, we, we've made a commitment. And I said, it's a rapid start patient. And he goes, it's a rapid start patient. Of course, we could see that patient 100%. So it was doing that education to everyone within the, the clinical system and making sure there was buy-in throughout the system. So how does this work? We have a linkage coordinator. I cannot say, uh, cannot stress how important our linkage coordinator was for the success of this program. The linkage coordinator had her own office. We we really put a red carpet outside of her office. Um, you walk in, she had a coffee maker. We thought that was really important in the office. And she did all the registration and consenting herself. It wasn't in the at the front desk. It was with her. And then she also did a quick introduction, the importance of ART. And she asked the most important screening question of all. Are you ready and interested in starting ART today? Everyone asked me, how do you know that someone is ready? How do you know they'll commit, they'll adhere? Um, there's a lot of subconscious bias that goes into this. We'll, we could unpack some of that later. To me, the most important question is, are you ready and interested? And if the answer is yes, you better have a damn good reason to not start a life-saving medication. Um, so if the answer is, is yes, then, then we're rolling. And then she would do a warm handoff to the provider. So you literally would walk her, the patient to the provider, um, and uh, you know we would start the visit. So in terms of the medical visit, we talk about the HIV life cycle, importance of adherence, and U equals U. Comorbidities were assessed, physical exam. Provider always had the option of not treating um, for any reason, and then we would provide a 30-day supply that allowed us the time to get someone enrolled in all of the insurance uh, programs that we would need. And then we did directly observed therapy. And directly observed therapy, the only reason we did this um, was because San Francisco did it. But I, I, I stop here because when we, when we provide that directly observed therapy, you open the bottle. I mean, I rarely ever open bottles of medication with a patient. I, I then, you know, break the seal and we, we hold the medication in our hand, talk about any side effects. And there's something really powerful about like holding the medication, handing that medication over, giving someone a glass of water. And I, you know, I don't want to be a little, uh, too soft here, but you typically hold the hand of the patient and they take their first dose with you. And I think that there's something so powerful about that relationship that develops. I mean, they are taking their first steps to being undetectable. Um, and I would watch it. I mean, patients would literally, after they took that first uh, dose, they, they would sit up in their chair. It was like a weight is being lifted off their shoulders. Um, and this also um, kind of reinforces the importance of that U equals U discussion. I mean, patients, I would have that conversation that there's a life-threatening disease, um, but so often the question would be, you know, have I transmitted this virus to anyone and can I transmit this virus to anyone else? And once I have that conversation and then they take that first step by taking the medication, um, you really feel a, a lightness. I mean, the, this diagnosis, which is often filled with, with unnecessary shame, um, 
everything changes. Um, and it's really, really powerful. Uh, one of my uh, clinicians, Dr. Murphy, Mary Murphy, some of you uh, may have uh, known her. She's been doing HIV work and since the late 80s, she was the head of the uh, downstate in, in New York uh, City Clinic in Brooklyn. Um, and she moved to New Orleans and she was uh, working with me at the end of her illustrious career. And she was really kind of against the rapid start model at first. She was like, I want my labs. I want my genotype. And one day she came into my office and said, you know, I just started someone uh, on medication. They uh, were brand new to care. Um, I gave them that medicine and watched them take the first dose. And it reminded me, this is why I went to medical school. Uh, and it's still kind of, uh, uh, I gives me a little uh, goosebumps every time I think of her having that comment to me. So it just really, really powerful. Post provider visit, we enrolled in insurance programs, labs, social work uh, for any urgent needs. You could see here, median age was 29 and a third were under um, 25. Um, and you could see the breakdown in, in, in terms of uh, gender. Um, risk factors. Um, so you could see this pretty much mirrors uh, what we saw uh, in, in New Orleans. Um, African-Americans had a higher risk of um, uh, HIV transmission, 65%, 70% in those returning to care. Um, but an increasing Latinx population as some of the uh, population in New Orleans has really uh, changed post-Katrina. The risk factors that we saw most often um, were uh, self-identification of men who have sex with men. Um, we're seeing more now uh, transmission from injection drug use, but then it was just around 5% uh, for both CCSI and EIS. STIs, you know, this I think makes absolute sense, right? Syphilis was was a, a quarter, gonorrhea and chlamydia were almost 30%, and then you could see hepatitis B or C. What I think is really interesting is our EIS cohort. These are patients that were known to be living with HIV, um, and you're still seeing about a third with syphilis. Um, so this, and, and we know that if someone has syphilis, they have a much higher uh, potential of transmitting HIV. So I think this shows that even though people were out of care, um, they really needed to be on medication because there might not have been changes or, um, they were, you know, they were still sexually active. They, were, they, they remained human, even if they knew uh, they were living with HIV. So again, the importance of getting people on uh, ART and treat their STIs as soon as possible. You can see here that um, most of, uh, or many of our patients were under 100% of the federal poverty limit. And a uh, slight difference, one out of five, one out of three for CCSI or EIS in terms of a mental health diagnosis. I love this slide. It makes me so happy showing it. This is, uh, I didn't know else, how else to define this. Under 12 hours was literally same day. Someone comes in at uh, 9 a.m. and they're seen at 10 a.m. that they're put, uh, put under uh, 12 hours. The red here is within 24 hours. So let's say someone comes in at 4 p.m. and we see them at 9 a.m. the next day. I had that as uh, 24 hours. So it wasn't exactly within the same day, like when the sun rose and sunset. And you could see almost 75%, I think it's 85%, 85% were seen within 24 hours of being newly diagnosed with HIV. This literally blew me away. If you asked when we started, I really thought 72 hours was like a real big ask. Um, but you could see this to me, this is patient driven, right? Because we're we're offering them a, an appointment. So this shows how committed patients were and continue to be um, to see a provider and start on ART immediately. So let's go over this data. This was a median enrollment at 20 months. So we had 100% linked, um, almost everyone starting on ART same day. So on that same day of uh, that they... Uh, you know, that they were linked into care. And you could see 97% achieve viral suppression um, and 93% in EIS. And you could see our retention in care, it starts to drop off. And then this goes all the way out to 33 months this is way beyond our HRSA measure um, of 12 months. You could see we're having people virally suppressed uh, at a rate of 91% for CCSI, but lower 80%. This was uh, significantly significant statistics, excuse me, statistically significant for EIS. So what does that mean to me? It means that, you know, we need to be doing this for both populations unquestionably, but we need to be really putting more resources 
into EIS. If a patient knew they were living with HIV and didn't link immediately, that is a risk factor for them not remaining suppressed 33 months later. And you could see that our time to viral suppression was 28 days. And this isn't rocket science. It's so fun. When I published on this, you know, there was an editorial that was like, this is amazing. He's, you know, suppressing people in 28 days. Our, our ART works that way. I think that it could have been 21 days. It was just that we saw patients and then we saw them three to four weeks later and almost everyone was virally suppressed by the time they came back. So when you start ART, unless someone is in that acute HIV with a viral load greater than 10 million, you're going to suppress them within four weeks. Um, so I also look here, this is maybe a better way to do this. I looked at or uh, broke it down by youth because there was a big question. This is not looking at EIA. EIS. This is just our newly diagnosed. So in Louisiana, um, those under the age of 25 have the highest risk um, of not uh, remaining engaged in care and then not remaining virally suppressed. So it's really a population that we're, we're quite concerned, the, the, a younger population being newly diagnosed. Um, and they're young and young and sexually active. And we, we, we really want to get them into care. So we're providing uh, all of the health services that they need. But CCSI, you know, starting people quickly, there was some, some real benefits here. So you could look at, we had 31 patients that were 24 or under, um, and the average uh, there was 21. You could see that 30 out of 31 achieve viral suppression, sustained viral suppression at 12 months. So that was their next appointment after 12 months where they virally suppressed. It was 83.9%, which is way higher than the 40% statewide. So it doubled our average statewide. But what I really love was this. We only lost one patient after 12 months, lost to care. Um, engaged in care, 96.8%. So our younger folks were still coming to care. We kept them engaged. And I really think it's something about that starting as soon as possible after diagnosis and you're building that relationship immediately um, after someone learns that they're living with HIV. Of course, you could see for the, the population that was older, our numbers were, were incredible. Um, but this was really exciting to show that we're making such a difference in our uh, younger population. So talk about how this then um, comes to policy impl uh, implementation or, or uh, how, how policy changes happen in the United States. Uh, many of you probably saw this. This is from the Department of Health and Human Services. This was the goal. This was the 2019 plan for America to end the HIV epidemic. And it's to diagnose all people with HIV as early as possible uh, after infection. Treat the infection rapidly. And that word rapidly was uh, used purposefully. I was in this the DHHS uh, and HRSA meeting where they, they wanted this um, to really highlight the importance of, of the Rapid Start program. Protect people at risk for HIV using potent and proven interventions, including PrEP, a medication that prevents HIV, respond rapidly to HIV clusters that prevent new infections, and then an HIV health force will establish local teams committed to the success of the initiative. And I should say the HIV health force should be made up of people living with HIV, much like the HIV planning council, um, in New Orleans that really drove uh, this whole um, program. So you could see that once we started um, publishing on our data uh, and presenting it, there was real policy implications at, at very high levels um, within the United States. So treat the infection rapidly. So what were the key facilitators of this intervention? Same day appointments, we had to make sure providers had flexible scheduling, we had to choose our ART um, that was uh, we knew was going to work. Now they got, we're going to get there. This is all before the guidelines uh, endorsed rapid. So um, availability of ART starter packs, that was key for me. I needed to make sure I could start someone and then uh, link them uh, into uh, insurance. So, you know, ensuring that I had insurance sustainability. Uh, for us, it was a patient navigator. No way I could do this work without a patient navigator. And then an accelerated process for health insurance initiation. And I love the DOT. Um, and then, as I said, guaranteed sustained access to ART. What was our lessons learned? You really need a physician champion. You need a program manager champion. So it wasn't just from the medical side. It was someone at the administrative level side. Um, 
these programs are an iterative process. I can't, we really needed to constantly take feedback and change. Um, we, we implemented change. Uh, we, we had a, um, you know, standard operating procedure that went uh, 24 times, I think, within uh, a two-year period. So almost monthly, we had a change that standard operating uh, procedure. Oftentimes, it was as simple as, you know, making sure that we built in a lunch break for a phlebotomist, but making sure that we had more evening uh, coverage. So really looking at when the diagnoses were coming in incorporating quality measures that can be reported. So it's really important for me to define that Rapid Start is a, a linkage to care initiative. I mean, I, I love to say that it has some downstream effects in terms of retention, but especially when you get out to three years or four years. I mean, you, you need the type of really innovative programming that Rapid Start is. So what was the quality measures for me? It was, did they make their second appointment because that was so important to me. That first appointment, sure, they're coming in, they were newly diagnosed. Are they going to make that second appointment? And then did they achieve viral suppression? Those were the quality measures that we would continually report on um, and then drill down on when we weren't, uh, when even there was a, a one patient that wasn't meeting one of those measures. So I mentioned the SOP and it needs to be shared and communicated um, with all leaders throughout the, the organization. And then, oh yeah, I forgot, this was huge. We did this, we started Rapid Start and we you know, rolled it out. We were presenting everywhere. We were so excited about it. And then about six months in, I had a, a new MA and she said, you know, Dr. Albert, I'm really embarrassed about this. Everyone talks about Rapid Start. I have no idea what you're talking about. And that was after she had been with us for almost six months. Um, she was one of our pediatric MAs. So she wasn't seeing Rapid Start regularly, but I recognized I needed to incorporate education within our onboarding so that everyone within the Crescent Care system knew exactly um, what we were doing and that this was um, core to our identity. And then celebrating successes. We do this well in New Orleans, um, but really like a quarterly drink where you could go over uh, quality and then really give time to, to celebrate those successes. Uh, whenever I'm asked, you know, what is the most important reason uh, that that uh, rapid start uh, needs to be sustained and or implemented in new areas? It's because it supports equity. I mean, that this to me is um, some of the more concerning aspects of uh, the history of HIV treatment and care in the United States. So this comes out of some great data that was um, captured in, in Washington, D.C., African-American men are more likely to have delays in ART initiation, even after seeing a prescribing provider. And what is so disgusting about this is when they asked why they didn't start ART, the number one reason was a presumption that a patient would not um, stay on antiretroviral therapy, like that they would not adhere to the medication. So they were not starting out of this uh, bias uh, that and African-American men were more likely to not adhere to medication. Well, no, no way to ensure that someone does not adhere to medication than not prescribing it at all. Uh, African-American men and women were more likely to prescribe a second line agent, most often a protease inhibitor, when compared to white men and women for the same exact re reason. There was a presumption that, oh, um, they're not going to take it right. They're not going to take it regularly. This was pulled from um, data that was uh, at a major academic center. So uh, really concerning data. To me, Rapid Start protocolizes, right? It protocolizes the best practice. And there's no better demonstration of commitment to a community than same day immediate access to a provider. Um, we are treating everyone with the best um, practice in, in medicine. And uh, some of you might know Dezan Diallo. If you don't, you need to. She's incredible. She started the organization Sister Love that's um, started in Atlanta, and they have chapters all over the, the country and all over the world. This was um, uh, her quote uh, when we presented our data in, uh, in London at um, one, of the, uh, one of the IAPAC conferences. Uh, if you see my brothers and sisters as your own, or see my brothers and sisters as your own, if you do, then of course you will see patients same day, start same day, and love same day. 
which to me uh, really reinforces why I feel so strongly about this model of care. So we then developed a consortium. Um, it's led uh, by myself. This is Adi Arana from UAB. That's Dr. Colasante um, from Emory and Tennis Vanig um, from Arizona. Uh, and what we wanted to do is we wanted to say to ourselves, okay, there's a lot of uh, questions on how to do this well, um, but we also want to set a, a, a play. We want to develop a place where where those that have implemented Rapid Start could be meeting regularly, talking about what's working, what's not working, and um, that we could publish our data and then advocate from our successes. So we we uh, decide we have to look at best practices, logistical hurdles. We have to do the research, and we have to constantly be advocating. Like we do, uh, like I said before, for expanded Medicaid for universal access to ART, because that that really is is that goes above and beyond everything else. And you can see I actually wrote this slide um, too long ago, and it was a PDF, so I can't add. Uh, we now have fifty six uh, cities that are represented uh, as part of our Rapid Start um, consortium. So changing uh, policy. Well, the consortium that developed a policy change plan. We said okay, you know, we're doing this. We're doing this at all these different sites. We really believe in this. Um, but the Department of Health and Human Services uh, do not um, yet endorse uh, a rapid start policy. So how should we do this? Well, we decide we need to publish and present conferences um, and continue um, to communicate expanded data. We reached out to the members of the guidelines committee. You know, they, they, they all are um, typically at major academic centers and um, have emails that you could email and say, hey, can we get on a phone call and discuss this? We requested an in-person meeting at uh, in Cornell to present our supportive data. We educated the guidelines committee, not just on the fact that we're implementing this in, in you know, dozens of sites nationally, but we collected patient statements on why it's so important that even a, a seven-day or 14-day delay would be so uh, would be difficult, and that the um, that it's so empowering to start someone immediately after they were diagnosed. So I'll go back. So what was it before? So this was the policy recommendations they had. This was of October two thousand seventeen. Um, don't forget, I started uh, in December of sixteen. So even before this um, panel said, and they said that um, ART is recommended for everyone to reduce. Uh, the morbidity and mortality associated with HIV. And then they said, when initiating ART, it is important to educate patients on the benefit and considerations of ART to address strategies to optimize adherence. And then they say, on a case-to-case -case basis, ART may be deferred, but that it should be initiated as soon as possible. Well, this case-to-case -case basis and using these clinical or psychosocial factors was so disempowering and didn't make it um, it didn't communicate how important that it should be incredibly rare to never that you don't start ART as soon as possible. So we met with them. We had all these conversations. And then in December 2019, three years after I started my project, um, you, you know, four and a half years after San Francisco um, and, you know, years after so many of the other sites, um, we finally were able to advocate so that the uh, there was a formal endorsement. So the panel recommends that ART be started immediately or as soon as possible after diagnosis. And then they recognize to increase the uptake of ART, decrease the time of linkage to viral suppression, therefore reducing the risk of HIV transmission and improving the rate of uh, virologic suppression among patients uh, with HIV. And the level of evidence they're giving is A2 which is pretty much the highest level you can do without doing a randomized clinical trial. And though we had many conversations with the guidelines committee that were asking us to do a randomized clinical trial, I personally, and so did everyone in my consortium, absolutely refused. We did not believe it was right to randomize people to either start immediately or to defer for four weeks. Um, when, when we were sitting in those uh, exam rooms with the patients and saw and felt how important it was to start immediately. Um, so here are the panel's recommendations. Uh, I know I, I said I was going to leave some time, but now I'm talking a little too much. So let me go through. This is the fact that we continue to uh, see a, a large amount of CCSI patients 
um, all throughout the pandemic. Um, but what really um, happened was we started to see a lot more of these rapid reentry uh, patients. So the fact that we did this right before the pandemic was so crucial because we had a lot of people living with HIV that during the pandemic, um, they were out of care, they weren't on ART, and they contacted our clinic and wanted to be started back on medication. And you could see, I mean, this is, um, you know, monthly, we're seeing between, you know, 10 to 30 per month that we're starting back on ART, which is so key to ending the ep epidemic. Uh, I believe really strongly in our status neutral approach where we should be treating and preventing um, HIV. We should be treating everyone. We all have a status. We all have an HIV status. Um, if we're living with HIV on treatment, if you are not living with HIV, please consider PrEP. And this is where I'll, I'll uh, this is where I get so excited that the 2021 guidelines um, endorse rapid PrEP. So it's the same day PrEP initiation protocols. We won't go uh, through this too much, um, but it showed that we were able to really um, have a paradigm shift within HIV care that, the, uh, that we want to start people on uh, life-saving medications as soon as possible. Um, so that was rapid PrEP. And then they went through who rapid PrEP is not appropriate for, um, and, and, uh, but they're, they're limited in scope. Um, so I'm excited that we have done this work. Uh, I am uh, really, uh, I think it demonstrates um, how to incorporate the best science, how to use implementation science, how to publish and research, you know, provide your research, and then how to advocate to change the guidelines. Because once the guidelines changed, the policy implications were incredible. I mean, now it is almost universal uh, for rapid start in HIV programming. So I, I'm, I'm really proud of that. Um, and I'm going to hand it back to you, Wari, uh, if there's anyone, uh, any questions, and, and I would love to, to leave some time for that.